Welcome to the Instinctive Influencers Podcast, a show where influence becomes one of your tools for success. Now, here are your hosts, Brian Weber and Ed Haley. Hi, I'm Brian. And I am Ed. And this is the Instinctive Influencers Podcast. Ed, the weekend is over. Uh, you were quite busy this weekend, I can tell. Oh, uh, man. Tell us about it, man. It's the worst, man. 24 hours of duty. Uh, it's just, I don't know. So, one, as I've gotten older, Brian, <laughs> recovery does not work <laughs> the same. I remember being 19 years old, 20 years old in the Army, have duty, get up that Saturday, head to Canada because I was at Fort Drum, drink all day and night, party, no issues. Man, you're lucky. i I'm lucky I make it home half the time it's after 24 straight hours of, of being awake. Um, it's just, it's rough. It's a, it's a rough duty. And you're, so where I am, you're by yourself. Uh, there is an officer mm. on duty, but they're in a separate section of the building and they're not allowed to leave. And I'm not allowed to leave at all. Like I have to call the officer if I'm going to use the, the facilities and forward my calls. So it's like very restricted to one little cube. Uh, but I did get to watch some great shows. Uh, I watched uh, Roman Empire on Netflix. I watched all of those. I watched all of the original Mad Maxes. So, I mean, that's as productive as it gets, man. <laughs> and fight the Z monster. So, yeah. Duty is just, oh, it takes so much out of you. Draining. You you feel, you, yeah, exactly. I And I know what you mean. I mean, it's been a, it's been a little while since I've pulled a duty like that. But uh, I, I can definitely tell you that, one of the things I noticed, and I don't know if you noticed this, but as I've aged, though, fighting the Z monster is not as hard because I already have a horrible sleep pattern as it is. You know what I mean? Like, because I can, I can, I, well, I don't go to bed early, but I don't go to bed too late. You know what I mean? Like, if I, if I go to bed about nine o'clock, I'm up at four, no problem. That's nine just o'clock. my routine. Oof, man. I'm, well, nine o'clock's my nine late time. I'm okay. Don't get wrong. My- pillow by the nine (laughs) o'clock but you do do you you don't find it that it's a little easier to stay up through the night or do you find it tougher uh so it's it's that same same kind of the same so you know about 3 a.m 2 30 3 a.m that's when it really gets rough my problem what i've noticed as i've gotten older is like i said before the recovery is just so for that 24 hours of being up straight Mm -hmm. it takes me two days like right now I could lay down and go to sleep and sleep all night tonight. Uh, I got off yesterday. I slept roughly six hours and then still went to bed my normal time. So like 8 p.m. Right. And still slept eight hours. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That's what I mean. It takes a lot out of me. It's very draining to me as I've gotten older. It's, you know, and <clears throat> so here's the deal. I, one of my, I guess this is a, this is a method I've used in the past and I still could kind of hang on to, especially. Um, so when we go to the field and stuff, I definitely, I pull longer hours to make sure everything is up and operating within a certain amount of time type situation. Right. But, um, when I'm trying to offset that schedule, like try to fix what's going on, I like to use, I, I get this, um, these like these little gummies, uh, Z-Quil makes it, NyQuil, Z-Quil, but they're all natural, the, uh, the chamomile type thing. And they help me kind of reset. The only problem I hate, and this is what I hate about these things that uh, help you, you know, to help re-engage sleep is the droggy, the weird like outer body feeling the next day when you wake up. The only thing is I feel reset, you know, and, and that's kind of what you need because I mean, frankly, you went, you worked Monday through Friday, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you had duty on Saturday. Yeah. And then we went out for a, a work dinner Friday night. So we didn't get out of that until nine 30. So it's not like I even got eight hours leading into that 24 hour duty. Right. Uh, of, of sleep. So. So then yeah, you know, it was next day <laughs> and you pull a full 24 hour day in a sense. Yep. So you, if you look at it, if you, if you were to bust that 24 hours up, let's just say it was a tw- two 12 hour days. You know, we know d- darn well that it seems like it many times we work full 12 hour days, you know, from the time you start to get up for PT through the time you get to go to, you know, home. But if you think about it, you pulled a full seven day work week. Now there's probably people out there in the civilian sector. They say, Oh, that's nothing. I do that every day. I got you. You, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, in our, in our situations versus theirs. And I, I can just say that 
some of the the mental factor, and we've talked about this before, the mental factor that goes into it really drains you, like literally exhausts you. And you're like, you know, you could pull physical um, seven days a week, but that mental factor of, you you know, you got to do this, you got to think about this, you got to plan this. Now you got to, you got to set up this, you know, all these different things. It really puts a, a toll on you physically because of all the mental, would you say? Yeah, I agree. I actually, um, right before she switched jobs to where she's at now, my wife did a stretch of seven straight days and she doesn't work 10 hour days, but it's still, you could see how tired she was after those seven days. Like you see how drained, um, um, she was, it was visible on her. So it's, it's not, you know, I mean, I also don't miss shift work when I was a civilian worker. I couldn't stand shift work day shift this week, night shift next week, that really tore me up. And I was in my twenties then, so I couldn't even imagine trying to do it now. Yeah. And you know what, this is, this is probably a good point where I throw a shout out to all of our stay at home moms and them that listen to us, because you know, darn well, they're, they're working a full seven day week, you know, and well, they're putting yeah, you know, 24 hours. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, and it's insane. Like, cause it drives me crazy when I see people like that, that want to, uh, they want to debate with a, a full-time mom of how their life is easier because they don't have a real job and all that. It's like, nah, believe me, a full-time day, you know, you put in, you put in work, you know, I, I watch, I watch Michelle. She goes, you know, since, even since I've been here, she'll, when the kids are at school, she goes to the school and puts in some work there to help the school, you know, produce, you know, whatever products they need and do things and, or whatever she needs to do around here. So it's, you know, and cleaning our house after my two yahoos get done with it. Plus me, I'm home now too. It, yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it puts a stressor on it. But well, I think this kind of leads into uh, this whole talk about you know how you know we put that stress on our bodies and whatnot. I think it really leads into the the topic of today's show, Ed. Uh, you know, uh, burnout is a thing, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and especially when you have yourself a star performer. Mm, yeah. It, it, I've seen it. I felt it. I've actually, I've made the, the, uh, the mistake of using the star performer too much, mm-hmm. you know, so Me too. we all fall into that, uh, category in a sense, some point in time. And the crazy thing is, is actually where we're pulling, cause you know, uh, audience out there, you know how we like to talk about the green notebook or the, the topic of from the green notebook and all the different articles. This article is actually, they're actually pulling it from another source also, uh, called, bridge3.com and it the, this actual article that we're using was designed for a corporate audience. So the topic though, if you think about it, it it, it works for everywhere because even in the military, we've talked about it, you've heard us talk about it on here before. Burnout happens when you just over push yeah. somebody, you overwork somebody, you, you and and you see it in them and you're like, "Man, you know? I mean, you brought it up just before we got started Ed talking about 30 days leave. Oh yeah, so you know, I was when I was reading this and prepping for this this uh, episode, Brian. I was really thinking, you know, yeah, I get it. Like ex- when I first came on, I was like, thirty days of leave—that's way over what I need. Awesome, but is it really? Because you need that opportunity. You know, you were just telling me too how being on leave and being with your family has given you an opportunity to recharge your batteries, right? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. But that's the purpose of that leave because the army wants us to perform at a high level. So that's why it's just like when we're deployed, you know, they give you, you get two weeks of leave or 18 days or whatever it's at. Now you get that leave to get an opportunity to recharge your batteries uh, to help prevent you from burning out. Now you still may burn out, but yeah, I think that 30 days, it it works out pretty well. Now, some of us like me, tend not to use it as effectively as I think it's intended for. Cause you know, I'll do a week here and then I might not take leave again. Like uh, I'm going to leave in November and I'm taking two weeks. And before that, my next leave would have been five days in June. So I didn't take, you know, but the army has this policy where if you don't have take so much leave, uh, eventually they'll cap you out and start taking it away from you. So yeah, you definitely exactly. lost 12 days this year for not taking enough leave. And that tells me that you're not getting the rest that you need, my friend. And you're on the path. True. Yeah. It says it right here. Three signs. The star performer is on a path to burnout. And that's to me, that's what that's what I say. And you're right. 
me taking, getting to take uh, 30 days solidly. Now, I started my leave uh, earlier this month and I actually will get back to Korea and I'll have about two or three days before I sign back in. But I need those two or three days kind of to, to readjust my time schedule because obviously jet lag is going to kick in and things like that. But I can safely say that coming home and just you know, enjoying the the peace and quiet, the no, no stressors. I don't have to worry about like making important decisions that could literally put people's lives in harm. Oh, well, other than me driving my children to school or walking them to school, um, <laughs> but it has helped me recharge those batteries. And I'm not excited to leave my family again. Once again, I'm not excited about that. But what I'm excited to do is to be able to say, you know what? I'm ready to get after it again. I'm ready to start engaging the same type of situations that I was dealing with before, because I can tell you, man, right before I left, I was starting to feel the pinch a little bit. And I think it had to do, um, you know, a lot of uh, in the emotional sense of, I do miss my loved ones um, because that happens. So I mean, it's just, and it's all on how you take it. And uh, I think we just got to get right into this and start uh, discussing what it means when we're talking about this burnout. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to talk about, Brian, though, uh, before we move in is, you know, you brought up a great point. Like I was just sitting here thinking about the feeling of you, you have when you take that leave and you come back, like you really, I know like when I deployed, uh, you know, you take 18 days, you go home, you see your family. And I had a particular, this deployment that came to mind, I had a particularly rough deployment. I had been medevac for pneumonia and I had a, a virus and I had spent some time in the hospital, you know? And, uh, I got home and I was home for my anniversary and and you just, I mean, you really, you go back into country after the end of that leave or wherever your situation is. And you really feel like you could take on the world. Like you feel like you are ready uh, to conquer the world after that because you're so refreshed and your battery's like right on full. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think it's, I, you you made that point. I, I think it's awesome, and uh, I'm actually really looking forward to my November leave to recharge my batteries uh, <laughs> in Dublin <laughs> with, with with the Haley clan. Yeah, I'll have my siblings, and uh, I am looking forward. Even though it's still stressful because they pick on me a lot, but uh, we'll see how I that think goes. You can, I think you can handle it. I think you can handle it. So yeah. So you ready to get started, Brian? Absolutely, man. And and towards the end, I'm going to throw some tips out here that I, I actually kind of jotted down as you, as we were been sitting here talking because I I've been thinking about like how to engage this. Um, so I'm going to start reading this, but right before I get at this, this is what I want. I want to put the listeners in a mind frame. Sunday night comes, let's say Sunday afternoon, about two to three o'clock. Does your mind go to, oh no, I have to go back to work. Oh, I don't want to do this, or when you wake up in the morning on Monday morning, do you roll out of the bed and you sit on the edge and you think, why am I still doing this? What is it? <laughs> I'm serious. No, because that right. happens. Yep. That happens, bro. Yeah. No. So the reason I laughed is, uh, you know, when I was contemplating retirement, uh, the last time I was up for a promotion, my wife said that, you know, you aren't ready. And that's kind of the sign I'm looking for to know I'm ready to retire is exactly what you describe. Like you wake up. You throw your feet over, you slip them in your house shoes or your flip flops or whatever your footwear is. And you, ah, why am I doing this still? I mean, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. one day I'm going to get that day. And then that's when I know, hey, maybe it's time for a uh, change of my path and recharge my batteries somewhere else. But yeah, that's why I laugh, Brian. It's just thinking about my wife and you're not ready to retire yet. <laughs> the funny thing is you brought that up. I had a similar conversation with the Bearded Ninja. Um, it was, it was via messenger. We, we, we messaged back and forth a bit. We were messaging back and forth and this was while I was still in Korea. And I was talking to him about the idea of continuing my service, um, may possibly even to, you know, probably compete for star major. And his exact quote to me was, you will know when it's time to be over. You will know, you will know that you, it, you're done. You can, and that's you know one of those things where I like, once I recharge these batteries, I am ready to get after it again. I, I still have like this dying love for everything it is to serve and not only to serve, but to, to mold mentor and be there with younger leaders and let them teach me things too, because I'm telling you, I, I'm not too old to learn. We talk about lifelong learning all the time. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I mean, it's so when you said that, I thought, wow, man, I'm getting the same advice mm-hmm. you are. Maybe we're not, maybe it's not time for us to quit, bro. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, for the listeners out there, today's broadcast is brought to you by the Bearded Ninja Beard Balm. The Bearded Ninja Beard, beard Balm. When you like snakes and watching them destroy things, but you also like a full beard. <laughs> Isn't that beard balm made out of the venom of cobras and pomade? I'm pretty sure. Now we'll we'll listen to this episode. (laughs) All right. So we're going to get ready to, I want to read a little bit here. um, Cause I, I do, I love how this starts off right off the bat. Cause it really gets you thinking. So how does a star performer turn it, turn into a loose cannon or experience complete and total burnout on the job? In most cases, there are telltale signs that can be identified in time to turn things around. So that turn into a loose cannon. How many times, Ed, have you seen somebody, you knew they were running to that burnout and they became a loose cannon? Uh, You know, you see it a lot in our career. You also see it with newly promoted first time leaders. So it's funny. So I saw loose cannon, had a hyperlink, clicked on the hyperlink. It actually takes you to... Uh, an article from the bridge three website. So it's, uh, the, yeah. So just for the listeners out there, you know, we got this from, like you said, the green notebook, but bridge three is like a leadership consulting firm. Um, mm-hmm. And basically it just says very first line is good enough to explain it. What is a loose cannon? This individual walks around the workplace, crushing people left and right. They are toxic. Uh so, yeah, I mm. wanted to see what it said about the loose cannon. And, you know, that is something that because you're you, you're like, man, this dude is really out of character. Like he's running around just snipping at people. I know I was like that as a young leader, too. Like, you know, just right off the rails, the stress and the, and the hey, I need you to do this and do this. And they just keep piling on my to do list. And then eventually it's like the next person to see me is going to have the unluckiest day ever. Absolutely. I, and I know exactly. And to tell you the truth, man, it's funny you brought that up because we've talked about it, how we've both experienced being toxic influencer, toxic leaders, mm-hmm. especially in a, an earlier rank. And you brought that up as you said, a newly promoted leader. I like to I like to equate that to a brand new Sergeant E5, new to being a leader, so to speak. I remember being that loose cannon. I remember being that one that would snap at anyone. Go ahead, be three minutes late or two minutes late. I'll hold the whole formation after work 30 minutes for your That's three right. minutes. You the know what I mean? Formation. Like some really toxic. Yeah, no, and I've done it. And I and I can tell you, I can test to it right now. There's a guy that I worked with back then. He was a young specialist when I was a sergeant. He's in now a sergeant first class there in Korea with me. Um, and I, I actually, you know, it's funny thing, Ed, I walked up to him uh, not too long ago and I said, hey, man, you know, and I, I, I've mentioned this on the show before. I said, hey, brother, I have to apologize to you. He's like, why? He's like, I said, I was really a toxic individual back then. And I've even talked about this on, on the show that I do. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, man, I feel like he's like, yeah, but we needed that. And I'm like, no, you needed leadership. You didn't need that type of leadership. And that was toxic in nature. And I, and I apologized to him for it because I was that loose cannon because at that point, I want to tell you, at that point, I had already gone through a deployment, all right? And it was myself and Sergeant Duncan. Sergeant Duncan, he, he's now retiring. He'll actually be retired. He should be uh, completely done with the Army in January, but he's retiring. One of my closest friends, it was me, him, and then it was uh, Sergeant Michael Taylor. Taylor got out years ago. He had some health issues that picked up, but we were kind of like the three running the show. We had 1E7. Sergeant First Class, who was our platoon sergeant, good man. Uh, we used to always, you know, rely upon him, and he did a good job. But the three of us, we were running that show, and you, you're talking about you're talking about taking. We were all in our. Uh, I think I think Taylor was in his early 30s at the time, but myself and Duncan, we were in our mid 20s. Like you're you're going to war for the first time. Uh, that's yeah. a stressor, and it tweaked up so much. So when I got back. I was like this top man that was ready to explode. And then I had a lot of personal issues on the side, family, personal issues that were, um, that were not helping it any. And I was just winding and winding and winding. And I mean, it turned into like an alcohol problem. I mean, it just turned into a lot of things, man. And I was snapping at people and treating people like total garbage. And now I think about it. I think about that loose cannon mm-hmm. being pushed too much, uh, to too much expected out of me. 
to a certain extent and I not know how to cope with it. Now, I'm not saying that I couldn't have done the job. I just hadn't learned how to cope with it yet. You know what I'm saying? And, and you didn't learn the, the necessary time management skills and all these things that lead to you being overwhelmed. I didn't know what time management skills were. I didn't know how to do that. I still, just I still struggle. <laughs> yeah, you see getting piles of, of junk and garbage piled on you. And then, yeah, no, you're at, to me, at least your story, Brian, is really, it's showing that you were overwhelmed and you didn't even realize you were overwhelmed because you didn't have enough experience to realize it. So Yeah, and that takes us uh, right into the very first sign, man, because it talks about yeah. this is about three signs that a star performer is on the per, uh, the path to burnout is they are overwhelmed. Uh, yeah, no, definitely overwhelmed. You know, and, and in here it talks about, you know, uh, exhibiting certain behaviors and, and you know, um, the loose cannon. Yeah, I mean, I can think of, numerous times in my career, Brian, where I had been overwhelmed and I didn't manage things well. Mm -hmm. So I didn't manage, uh, you know, that overwhelming feeling. I didn't manage stress. Now, now through all this experiential learning I've done in my lifelong learning <laughs> of leadership, I have gotten better at handling those things. But man, back in the day, yep. and my wife knew it. My wife recognized things. So if I got yelled at or stuff like that, or I was just stressed out at work or overwhelmed, I like to come home, sit by myself and play a video game when I was, you know, in my early thirties, mm -hmm. uh, that was my way of coping, but that wasn't a good coping. The better coping to me now, the better coping would have been to talk to my wife and have a discussion, not ignore her and go isolate myself in another room. But that's just, you know, that's how I dealt with being overwhelmed when I didn't realize I was overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, and the funny thing is Ed too, is people, not everyone is overwhelmed the same way, you know. So I may talk about something that doesn't seem as overwhelming to you, or vice versa, or we may talk about something that seems like overwhelming to us together, but somebody listening might say, Well, that's not really overwhelming. Let me tell you overwhelming. Well, it's because everybody has their own level of overwhelming. And to really to really help understand this, what I want to do is I'm gonna throw out this scenario that that we're given here. And it's and it's what's gonna help us look at each one of these three steps. All right. Yeah, let's let's you let's use Pat to help us along, Brian. Exactly. Pat, a star performer has been crushing it at work. A real force multiplier who raises the bar for everyone she works with. She has been a key driver on her department's performance and has been identified to supervise a new project, which comes with new levels of responsibility. Rather than preparing her for new responsibilities by giving her with some management training, her boss decides she should start her new role immediately. And so she does. What happens next is critical. And if unnoticed, can lead to the end of stardom. A wise manager will pay attention to the signs. Three signs that a star performer is on the path to burnout. So why don't you give us what, it has, what we're talking about here with the, oh, they are overwhelmed. All right, so they are overwhelmed. So let's talk about our good friend Pat. So before the promotion, before her promotion, Pat's a strong, a strong contributor as an individual. Now she has to supervise 16 others. It is safe to say Pat is overwhelmed. She exhibits all the behaviors of someone who is completely stressed out. She is transforming from a high performer to a loose cannon. Boom. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now let's think about this, right? So it talks about her being a contributor as a, as an individual. You know just as well as I do, Ed. Let's talk about we we both like working out, right? And we've talked about it many times on the show. We love working out. It's easier for me and probably you to focus on self. But now, what happens if you throw in a mix of five to ten people when it comes to working out, Ed? What 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 do you experience from that? All right. First of all. One of us works out in a style that five to 10 people wouldn't be as big a deal because you do brown robin or something. The other of us, me, works out. You know how mad people would be if I showed up to the bench uh, at, a, at a gym with 10 people? However, what I, what I will give you, Brian, is um, it's just you, it's too much. You know, let's think about that poor bench. You got 10 people trying to bench press. It's overwhelming to that bench, too, because... Nobody mm -hmm. or you know, nobody else is gonna be able to get on there and it's the you know, the same old, same old. Um so yeah, I, I mean there's multiple factors in there, man. So the thing about it, if you only have one bench and you have let's just say five people, all right. Well, while that one person is working out, 
what are those other four people doing? You know, or even yourself. So that puts five cell phone. People. <laughs> They're just sitting there doing nothing. So now as a leader, you're stressing out not only as the person on the bench getting after it, plus how am I going to keep these other ones engaged? So now I got to come up with different stuff throughout. Now I have to do this multiple days a week. It can be stressful. And that's kind of why, you know, people can frown upon PRT, right? If done correctly. And those of you who don't know what PRT, it's physical readiness training the army has. You can find it FM 22 dash seven. Uh, you can, uh, you can research yourself. That is open to the market. Anybody can look at it, can understand it. It gives all kinds. And that's what, that is one of the things I do like about it because it offers up different types of workouts, whether it be free weights, machine weights, cardiovascular machines, doing things body weight wise, out running. Just, it gives you so many different elements that you can use to perform. It even gives you, no joke, like a 90 day plan you can take that 90-day plan and, and just incorporate it and go through that 90-day plan with them to help get things going with that group. So, you you know, the planning part now is taken out and now you, you have a little less stress for us. And that's that's like one of the things I notice with uh, young NCOs, young sergeants, especially in the Army, is they think they have to come up with something new every single day. And it's like, well, no, not really. For instance, I run what I call the first sergeant PRT program. And those are the people who did not make the mark and didn't um, pass the APFT. So they have to do PT with me. I run every two weeks, every two weeks, not run. I do a thing where two weeks, it's the same thing as Mondays, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then the next two weeks, I change things up and I do the same thing for two weeks in a row each day, but then I switch it all around. What that does is it allows me one week of planning it another week of kind of just falling back in on it and seeing how we're performing better or whatever. And then I start planning again. So now I'm busting it up into sections. So I'm not having to constantly come up with something new every single day. And that's where I see a burnout of just, you, you'll say, Hey, Sergeant, such and such, you're going to give PRT next week, this day. And they get stressed out and all this like, well, I don't know what they're doing today and tomorrow and all this, you know, I mean, it's just, it really turns into a, overwhelming factor for them if you know what i mean yeah no i, I do and prt is a good example so the so let's talk overwhelming if i give the same person right so you talked about um having some kind of like different training each day but if i'm tagging that same guy every day or gal every day to give prt that's overwhelming and eventually i'm going to dry up the well and they're going to run out of fresh ideas and we're going to start doing you know, uh, with the army after a while, what do we do? Push up, sit up, two mile run, push up, sit up, two mile run. Like, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, you got that star performer. So you, when you've tagged that person so right now, I told you that I've seen some substandard PRT instructors. Now I got the one that's good, right? Hey Weber, get out there and give me P give PRT today. Hey Weber, get out there and give PRT today. Eventually Weber's going to run out of ideas and I'm hurting his drive to get out there and do a great job because I'm punishing him for being a performer mm -hmm. and it's going to be overwhelming to him. That is exactly what it is. You just, you, you hit the nail directly on the head, drove it home, man. You're you, they feel as if they'll be, they're being punished because they're good at what they do. I seen it. And, and you know what? We can take this even further. I seen it in aircraft work. All right. Um, was what I used to do, and you know, I'm not allowed to really touch aircraft that much anymore now because obviously the positions yeah. I'm in. But what I used to see is those those of us who were a little bit better at the troubleshooting and fixing problems, we would get so burnt out on just doing that all the time and being the go to. Oh no no, just give it to Weber or oh give it to uh, you know Smitty over here or give it to whoever and have them do it. It's like okay, at some point, when are the other people? Uh, within the organization going to get going to get a chance to learn and do it themselves you know and absolutely we we don't see that sometimes because all we're thinking about is mission first got to get this mission done well yep. i learned something absolutely. a long time ago ed and you have too you take care of the people they'll take care of the mission that's that's something i've been living by for a long time if i take care of my individuals my groups my teams they're going to take care of that mission. They're going to make sure it happens, right? Um, and it's funny, you brought, you, so you talked about their productivity and how it's going to decrease or they're going to get, you know, they're going to lose production. And we were only mentioned PRT. You think about it. As a young sergeant NCO, not only would they be given that PRT, also 
they have to be evaluating and doing counselings and and mentorship of their young Joes Mm -hmm. every month on top of their regular job that they are assigned to do on top of checking up on their Joe's regular job that they're assigned to do, because obviously it's, you do have to trust people, but it's called trust, but verify. You got to verify that the job is getting done because what if they are making mistakes and you got to adjust it. So at some point, yeah, I mean, and, and it's okay to check the checker. It's just not okay to micromanage it, you know, but just that right there itself, man, it turns into just a total overwhelming feeling. And now it, now you have that person, whatever, I'll do it. You obviously aren't competent enough to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like you hear that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you brought up the aircraft thing. That's kind of funny because I spent the majority of my career working in the motor pool on the wheeled side of the house. And I have been in one, two, three, four, five, six different motor pools I've worked in. Every motor pool has one mechanic, one guy who that's the guy. You know what I mean? Like he's the guy that people seek out. He could be doing anything and people, Hey, can you take a look at my vehicle? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he's assigned to another set of vehicles, but his reputation is that he's the guy. Mm -hmm. And I had a commander one time, his name was captain Tom Allard. And he told me you're a victim of your own success. Mm. Yeah. We talked about that before, man. Yeah. Victim. And that's what this is. This is a, you know, that one guy is always, and guess what happens to that one guy when a vehicle has to be pick, fixed and it's 1700 and they're like, it has to be fixed tonight. It's that one guy that's going to get drug in there to fix it. Who's probably it's been not there. Gonna be, yeah, yep. It's not going to be, yeah, it's not going to be Schmuggatelli because all Schmuggatelli does is sweet floors while one guy works on vehicles normally. Mm-hmm. So Schmuggatelli don't have the knowledge base to do it. And now we're affecting one guy's home life. Mm-hmm. And we're overwhelming one guy Absolutely. and then now he starts looking around and going okay this is too much you and, know what i mean and that leads into our very next point ed loss of productivity from a leadership perspective and then we're talking we're going back to our friend pat here from a leadership perspective yes. pat is becoming less productive because she simply doesn't have the resources experience or time to give her attention to things that need it so she defaults to micromanagement using directive, not outcome-based leadership to assert control instead of allowing her team to work through its challenges. Man, have we not seen that before where somebody just, I I, I can tell you, I think we've experienced it uh, together and also we've most most likely experienced it separated, but I've seen it where that micromanagement piece just comes in. You're just like, come on, just let some, let some control off, you know, allow us to kind of free roam and figure this out and give us pointers here and there, but don't try to run the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh no, no, I definitely do. And I, I mean, I'm not, so I'm anti micromanagement normally, but I know there are certain scenarios or situations where it could become maybe a little more, um, you know, viable. It could be something we could use, but for the most part, man, this is like, this is like somebody telling you, you know, if when we went to basic training, they just said, hey, be up and dressed and outside at this time, right? They didn't say, get up, put your left leg in your shorts, put your right leg in your shorts, pull your shorts up with two hands, walk to the latrine. They didn't, it wasn't that micromanaged. They just said, hey, here's where you get to and go. And I think basic training was an excellent tool for us because they also would say, hey, your first time to be outside in a formation is at zero five. Before that, you need to have your bed made, get dressed, brush your teeth, and shave, right? They didn't tell me to, how to do it, what order or anything. They just said, make it happen. Oh, by the way, you're in a bay with 30 dudes, and there's four sinks, so y'all figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, that's the the lack of micromanagement. They let us make something happen, and, and I think that's important. So, But with these high performers, you know, eventually – like let's talk about uh you know uh mechanic the guy all right eventually the guy okay i gotta stay on 1700 and i got this other dude you know schmuggatelli's gonna help me all right schmuggatelli i need you to grab that wrench turn that bolt three turns pull that off do this that and he's micromanaging the whole thing and and his productivity is going down because he's so busy guiding schmuggatelli he's not working at the same time where if i say hey schmuggatelli I need you to drop the oil pan and I go to work. 
Schmuggatelli can drop the oil pan on his own. He can figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm working. Schmuggatelli's working. Now we're getting some productivity. Absolutely, man. And, you know, I, I, it kind of brought me to a thought. I hear we're, we were, we got into this discussion about it, Ed. And we've talked probably about pa- uh, Patrick Lincioni uh, books before uh, and that we found to be good. I, I have one actually sitting right here in front of me. It's called The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. And I started thinking about this. I'm like, wow, man. So, for instance, when you do have that star performer and then that go-to person, like I started wondering how those other people feel within that organization. What, how would oh, yeah. they, how, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What, what is it at night when they go home? Did they think about how uh, important they are to the organization? You know, he's the favorite. What's that? <laughs> he's, he's the pet, the favorite. He's, yeah, you know, he can do no wrong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so it, it, funny. So we're going through these three, but on top of that, Patrick, he puts in his book about the three signs, anonymity irrelevance and immeasurement. And when he talks about anonymity, he says people cannot be fulfilled in their work if they are not known. All human beings need to be understood and appreciated for their unique qualities by someone in a position of authority. So you think about that. If I'm overusing this, you know, Schmuckatelli guy, and I'm really like, <laughs> I'm going to town every day, he's getting all the good stuff. And then I got, I got uh, Snuffy over here, not getting anything. And it's just, hey, Snuffy, go uh, go sweep the floor again. Yeah, yeah, I know you just did it, but we got to make sure it stays clean. Am I really making that person feel like they're a part of the organization, they're a part of the team, that I'm being a good leader for them? I, to tell you the truth, if anything, I'm being, a, I would say, a toxic leader because I'm, yeah. as the leader of that young individual that I'm creating burnout over here, I'm not utilizing my talent management that we've spoke about many times. I'm not using that talent management to properly place people in positions to make them grow. Not only make them grow, but to help enable their growth to learn more. So yeah, man, I mean, you you kind of, when you started talking about the drop in the drip pan, all that stuff, it's like, oh man, what is it those other individuals are lacking? So yeah, and it's funny, you, you brought up the other individuals. I just thought about a young soldier that, that I had in the motor pool I worked in. He didn't, it didn't work for me, but he worked in the motor pool. And he came in, young private, you know, uh, older guy. So you, first of all, I, I figure he does have a work ethic. But so he starts being the guy that sweeps. He starts being the guy that cleans the bathroom at the end of the day every day. Well, eventually the soldiers no longer even try to take out the trash or sweep because they're like, hey, LeBron's got it. So they just ignore it. And then now that's his reputation. Like LeBron's not a great mechanic, but he's really good at doing janitorial, you know, duties. But he got robbed because the other mechanics were those guys that we, you know, they were the star performers and we weren't giving that mentorship to him until we got deployed. Now, all right, well, you ain't cleaning latrines down here. There's KBR for that. And so now he's got to learn to be a mechanic and it's been a year. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. so now he's behind. He's behind his peer group. And so we're having an effect, not just on our star performer who we're going to figure out about that we're burning out. But what about the guy we're not teaching to become the leader? Absolutely, man. Crucial, right? Absolutely. So <clears throat> we've already we already see there it, we talked about is they become overwhelmed and the loss of productivity. Once you take us into that third point, man. All right, number three. As Pat's constituents become less productive and more disengaged, the new supervisor decides to ask for feedback, a three sixty because Pat heard it was a good thing to do. Not because of the growth mindset that feedback is valuable. After Pat receives the feedback and is not painted in a favorable light, but full of opportunities for growth, learning, and change, it is rejected because Pat was not developed to view constructive feedback as an opportunity to get better and views this as a threat to authority. So the death spiral of performance and conflict continues until Pat hits burnout. Yeah. So the number three is not open to developmental feedback. We haven't talked so, I mean, about ego, bro. Yeah, we need to. Uh, <laughs> so this this is this one was pretty cool to read too, because I was looking at it and I was like, you know, all right, not open to developmental feedback. What were they talking about? And then they brought up three hundred and sixty, and we've talked about the three hundred and sixty assessments that the military has used in the past. And 
And so when we get it, it is an opportunity for growth because you can actually set up a session and get some counseling and mentorship on your weak areas to try to um, improve and grow. So right here, if Pat takes that feedback and actions it, we can prevent Pat from feeding back or from burning out and we can make Pat a better leader. But Pat doesn't want to do all that, just dismisses it, kicks it to the side. And now we're still continue on this path till Pat finally burns out. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what I see? Um, and you may, you may be able to test this or not. I'm not sure. Uh, what I see is when you have a newly promoted leader and I, I want to go back to that Sergeant E5, but it can happen at the staff Sergeant level. It could have, um, it could happen at the officer's levels of, you know, going from Lieutenant to captain. It could happen, you know, staff Sergeant to Sergeant first class, captain to major, What it doesn't matter. But what I see is normally you have two different types of individuals. You have the, the one who is unsure completely. So they're always, always verifying and re-verifying if what they're doing is correct because they constantly need that uh, reassurance. Or you have the vice versa. I'm a know-it-all. I got this. Stay out of my business, right? So I, you never really catch that right in between kind of person where I'm a little bit unsure, but I have an understanding. I'm going to try to get after it, but I'll still come ask for opinions every once in a while. But if I'm able to do it myself, then I will. You don't have that middle area type person. I often see the two spectrums, and that's what I kind of get out of this uh, not open to development of feedback. To me, that's kind of like on that that far end of the spectrum of feedback is, you know, that's BS. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm amazing. Why would you guys talk like that about me? You know what? The hammer's coming down. And so I've dealt with that before, man. And so I would definitely say that... <laughs> I've, I've dealt with a person once they found out that somebody was saying things, um, that were going to, it was going to be detrimental to their career. And that person knew that I was rating one of those individuals and that person kind of approached me, Ed, and said, Hey, you should really, really, uh, really make their, their, uh, their evaluation report look harsh on them. Uh, and yeah, yeah it, it was, it was tough for me. It was tough for me, but I was actually, I, I think I was at a, I've been at a good point in my life now for the past 10 years or so. I was at a good point where I was able to look at that individual and say, I'm sorry. That's not the type of person I am. Uh, I have to give them an honest, true feedback of what's going on. I understand the pain that you feel or what's going on, but at the same time, that doesn't, that can't be a part of my evaluation of that individual unless it's false, untrue and all this stuff. And then we, you know, and then obviously an investigation have to happen type of thing, which was, you know, it went through and the person that was asking this of me was found guilty of such a things um, <laughs> by the investigation. So I don't know, man, it's one of those things where we have to, we have to really be careful about how we, uh, we offer up criticism of people. But at the same time, we also have to be open-minded enough to accept that feedback. You know, yeah. you talked about, didn't you, you just talked about the last show when we were talking about the AARs and you mentioned about our wives or our own version of AARs. Yep. We have to be open to like that. If there's anybody in this world that we should be open to, it's our spouses. So no matter, you know. Yeah. And you know, uh, I think my attitude at work as a leader changed and I joke about it with her and I know she meant no ill by it, but you know, and, and the first few times it was even funny, but when my wife started introducing herself as I'm sorry, Haley's wife, the, ass, you know, um, it, it really, re it resonated with me, Brian. I was like, okay, so this is my wife saying it. And I know she means it in jest, but is that what I really am? And then I started looking and I was like, I am, I am that. Uh, so it, it helped, but that was feedback. It wasn't necessarily delivered in a great way, but it was feedback and we joke about it now, but I am no longer that guy. Yeah, it's good, ish. man. You know, I mean, <laughs> ish. no, but I mean, it, that's, that's, that's a, that's a key factor though in your growth, you know, and that you, you actually took that as a constructive feedback, even though it may have not been purposely uh, utilized as constructive feedback. You know, yeah, no. it was somebody making a comment and you thought, wow, it's funny. Uh, not, it was quite a while back. Um, and this is when I was still kind of a tyrant type, so to speak, <laughs> before I went recruiting. Um, and my current wife now, we were 
supposed to be getting married. We're, we were literally, I think we were only a week or two away from, you know, being married. Uh, but she was at something with me and I would, there was a way I was talking to some of my soldiers and then and, and she may remember this. She may not, I don't know. We were in the vehicle and she made a comment to me. It was, I can't believe that they haven't kind of revolted against you yet because <laughs> the way you treat them. And it made me think a little bit, you know, and, uh, I would definitely say that I've got, I've got some guys out there that, you know, they're, they're pilots now. Like I, I could tell you, I probably have about a squad's worth of guys that were enlisted before and they became pilots. Even some of them are retired now. Uh, but it's, it's funny because it's like red, red is one of them. He, uh, he was, I mean, I used to, uh, I used to come on down onto him so hard and whatnot. And he's still as faithful as all get out. I mean, he's there for me if I were to ever need it. Um, if I ever called him for something, I guarantee he'd be in his truck and driving to help me out because of the type of person. Now, do I, do I think it's how I treated him? So I don't think so. I think it's how I turned things around with a relationship as we got down the road, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So and it was that developmental feedback that I received from my spouse that helped me transform something at my workplace. So we can be, we should be open up to feedback 360 degrees. So when I take when I think about that 360 degree, I think 360 degrees in our life. If my son looks at me and says, you know, dad, you're kind of harsh on me about X, Y, and Z. I've got to think about that right now. Was I really, or was I not? You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where you have to take that in and, and uh, look at it from a different perspective. That's all. Yeah. No, that, that's an excellent point, Brian. All right. So here we go. Let's talk about why burnout happens. All right. As human, as human beings, we do not have unlimited psychological resources to commit to leadership and supervision. Oh man, I can tell you <laughs> unlimited psychological resources. No. <laughs> Every day, those resources are depleted and need to be replenished, unlike a car, which will run out of gas and will simply stop. Humans, if they are not refueled, keep going right through a burnout in the workplace. And as research has shown into the realm of unethical decision making. And there you have it. Pat went from star performer with potential to a burnout unethical leader unethical man hey how many times you know it's just it's just one of those things where people think they're doing the right thing and they're actually like they're crossing that border of being unethical in nature and treating people a certain way and then it turns into it could turn anything from an eo to a sharp to a just a general uh toxic leader type situation man oh man can't live through that <laughs> what's that i said i've lived i've I've served through that one. Yeah, and and it's and it's not easy, right? No, it's hard being on the other end of it. Like, you know, I, and I'm not saying that person was necessarily a star performer at any point, but you know, when it turns to that and it gets toxic, man, that is an unethical. That is rough to be a subordinate to. It is. So, so when you say that, Ed, are, are you saying that you've served on both sides of being receiving and also giving? Uh, I don't, I don't think I've gave so much. I mean, I probably made some poor decisions. I don't know if they were unethical decisions. Mm, but well, well, let's, not, let's not think, let's not think that way. All right. Cause we're talking about the burnout situation, right? What I'm getting at is maybe have you been one of those people where you've received all the, the push, 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 and you became burnout. But at the same time, you've also done that to someone. At, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah now, I which, which do you think it, happened first? It, uh, I was that person, but it was really a Manning. I, so I'm justifying it, but it was a Manning thing at the time. We came back from deployment very, very early in the war on terror. Lots of people left the organization. Kind of, I wasn't leaving the organization. And um, so I was doing the work, you know, of, of so I had, it was myself and two mechanics and I was doing the work of three people in my specialty using those mechanics. And because they were untrained, unknowledgeable, I just took a lot of the burden on myself. And, you know, I do remember it having an effect in my home life. Like I was spending a lot of extra time at work and you know what I mean? So I've definitely been on that side. Um, cause I just got promoted. Like, like I said, so it's just a weird situation. 
but the um i have had that it would just be a saying about the horse i've definitely had that soldier who i have had it was my star performer and i have tried to ride that soldier to the wheels fell off um but then what happened i actually got fortunate because then some other soldiers kind of well, you know we talked about the kevin cruz book about play favorites so i had some other soldiers who kind of mimicked what that soldier was doing and and mm-hmm. now i've got you know now i've got two star performers now i got three star performers so they mimic kind of saying, hey, he's the favorite. I want to be the favorite. How can I be the favorite? And watching what he did. And, you know, that was the influence of, hey, yo, Andy. So that way I can say who it is without saying who it is. But that was the influence of, hey, yo, Andy uh, within that organization. And that hasn't been a lot of years ago, Brian. Actually, that would have been when we first met that I had that that going on. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you learn from it. And I was, like I said, I was fortunate. I was fortunate. Other people wanted what he was doing and they jumped on it. And, you know, I, I, it became a little bit more infectious in a organization where we were all read, led by a toxic individual. You know, and, you know, it brings me to another question though. Would you say that you almost have to go through it to be able to understand it? Yes. Cause I, I did. So, towards the end of that deployment, I started to recognize it. I started to recognize it. So he was in a position where he had a lot of responsibility and uh, towards the end of the deployment, I actually moved him and kind of like took some of that burden off his shoulders because I started to see it. Like I started to yeah. see, and yeah. you, you know, you have your go-to, but what happens when I wear out that go-to guy? And uh, no, so I started being yeah. able to ease back. But fortunately, that was also around the time when it clicked with the others. So as I ease back off this guy, I've got others, you know, kind of stepping up. Um, and, and and it wasn't it wasn't co- uh, competitive, like crazy competitive, but it makes me think of. So, you know, I'm from Maryland. So when you throw crabs in the bushel basket, they're climbing over each other. Everybody's trying to get to the top. And that's kind of how they all were. They were all like, I want to be the favorite. I want to. And it was kind of like little. Maryland blue crabs climbing up the side of the bushel basket, but man, those guys were performers. I'm telling you, I had about four really great uh, specialists. Uh, unfortunately, one stayed in the army, and uh, he's he's had some great success. So yeah, and he was the initial guy. He was my initial one. I was burning out. Yeah, and you know what? That's good that you were able to recognize it. it I can tell you that I've been through multiple scenarios, multiple times where. I was recognizing it and I like, I, I literally had to put the brakes on, reevaluate what was going on to ensure that I was putting the right uh, course of action or COA into play to help establish um, a spread of responsibilities across leaders. You know, because uh, so I got, uh, let me tell you, I got this one guy that actually works for me now. And I would say he works for me. He, he, uh, yeah, but he does, he's in my company now. And he is a real go getter, man. Like he's a he's a really good NCO. And I'm starting to notice that sometimes he's used a little too much. So I know how to pull back on the reins. And the reason being I say this is because there was a little while there that that individual was like, say for instance, he was constantly the one that was being put on running ranges. And I'm like, no other people need to experience this so they understand what it takes to do that. Because not only one, when this guy leaves, all the experience is leaving with him. So we need to spread the wealth. Two, if I constantly do this, this person is going to get burnout and they're want to do they're going to want to do less for this organization. So I kind of help had to imp, help get it implemented that we spread the wealth and allow other non-commissioned officers to take ranges for, for instance, and allow them to run those ranges, man. So yeah, man. Wow. Uh, so we go a little bit further into this. If they learn anything in business school about leadership, much of what students learn is about leading from the top of the organization. That is not the true nature of organizational leadership. Great organizations have leaders at all levels. They understand today's fast paced landscape. They cannot rely simply on hierarchy as they move into action, they have to develop leadership throughout their organization. But let me go back a little bit here. It says star performers hold value for any organization. 
This type of behavior can cost the organization value as productivity drops, workers become disengaged, and it has to deal with the decisions the burnout leader has made. Good news is this can all be prevented with an investment in the development of people before promotion or others taking on a new responsibility. So what we're talking about here is exactly what we've been discussing the whole time here is let's spread the wealth, man. Let's, let's, let's allow others to do things. You brought up earlier, Ed, you said something about it was you, you were a newly promoted leader and you had like, like two other yeah. uh, mechanics. mechanics within that motor pool you were running. So before, before it turned into that crew of three, how many was it? So the, the issue was that where I worked was like the nucleus of the, of the motor pool. So it was very much right. a quartermaster run. So before we came back from that deployment, there was one, two, three, four, five. There's five of us that were quartermaster, and we had one mechanic who was our supervisor. And when we came back, all of them left <laughs> except me and one other guy, and they moved him. So it was like, uh, so you were you were literally starting over a new team then? Yeah, a new team with two people whose job it was not to uh to you know it wasn't their job to perform so they had no real experience other than being on the customer side not the customer service side of that part of the motor pool so really th- this uh, to me uh, what, uh, and i'm only going off what you're saying there uh looking at it it's kind of like one of those things where we would say we needed to start recruiting for more people to come into that organization to help lift that burden off of what was before a large number of people running. Now we have a small nucleus and it's not like the workload uh, got smaller. Nope. If anything, it got bigger because you had less people to carry all the burden. Yep. No, I a hundred percent agree. And you know, at the time when it all happened, like, I mean, the leadership all changed for us and there was no standard operating procedures really in place. You know, at that point, and we had just came back from the appointment first deployment for that unit for you know in, in years and years nobody because like i said it was we're talking 2002 uh no 2004 so very very early in the you know deployments to iraq and afghanistan so yeah it was it was it was a challenge uh, mm-hmm. and i remember i actually remember feeling burnt out like i remember feeling like this is just too much too much to handle and once again, I want to go back to that idea of burnt out though. When we, when we speak of burnt out, one of the things you're talking about there, it's, it's that idea of when you wake up in the morning, you actually dread going to work. You're like, Oh, I gotta go do Absolutely this again. Did. Or that Sunday beforehand, Ugh. you're like, Oh, I gotta go to work tomorrow. And it literally ruins, it ruins your Sunday. Your Monday has already ruined your Sunday yep. because you're already starting to think about that. I yeah. mean, it almost um, made me get out the military. It ruined like my perception of the military. Luckily, again, my wife said, yeah, no, you're not getting out. But um, yeah, so there were some issues to it, you know? Yeah, I, let me let me speak a little bit further on this. And I'm going to go into it. Uh, it would be more about um, abuse, like maybe alcohol abuse, right? Uh, what I noticed, and this is on self, okay? This is a this is long time ago self. What I noticed is <clears throat> when I reached Fridays, I was power drinking, right? And I would power drink through Saturday also wake up and I would, I would just, you know, basically it was hungover weekend type things. But once it started turning into, all right, well, you know what? Tuesday night's not too bad. I can have a drink on Tuesday night. And then, you know what? Maybe Thursday night. So if I bust it up a little bit, I'll bust it up. That way I only do Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then I got some days in there. And then I would also turn it into, oh, well, you know what? It's not really hurting me. So why not just start off on Monday? I'll have a couple on Monday. And then soon enough, Wednesday's getting included in that. So now I'm I'm basically, I was personally hitting the bottle about six days a week kind of thing. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying to where I was like blackout or anything, but I was cre- it was creating a habit at the time because I was allowing the stressors created through the through the uh, the burnout period to get to me, along with my personal life and things like that at that time, and it was creating this. T- this um, new person, in a sense, that's the way I was. I, I felt like I was a new person, and I was also the same thing on Sundays, dreading going to work. Mondays mornings, I dreading getting out of the bed. 
every day, Monday through Friday, I was trying to get out of bed and it just turned into this. I literally hate my job. I, I and I've, I've, I even, there's a couple of times where I've looked over at my wife and said, I hate my job right now. You know, obviously I don't feel that way anymore because I've turned my mindset around and we're going to get into that, but that's what self happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm listening to it going, yep, can relate to that, can relate to that, yep. So, yeah, that's, that's excellent, Brian. Yeah, it, it's just, it. that was just, that's how I identified it. And that's, that's the thing, though. You can identify it with self, but the problem isn't that. It's, the problem could really often fall into how does the leader identify in their subordinates, Right. And be able to notice those small things that we, those three small things that we brought up, be able to understand it. Are they acting overwhelmed? You know, are they seeming spastic? Are they, are they blowing up? Are they being that loose cannon that we talk about? We want you to look that up too. Yeah. Um, I will attach the link to this article on the show. I want you to click, if you get that chance, click on where it says loose cannon. And I want you to look that up and you're going to see some stuff. You're gonna be like, Oh wow, that's happening in my organization right now. You know, I want you to think about that loss of productivity. And, and a lot of times what you don't realize is you, you don't see the loss of productivity, but you're, what you're not seeing is the fact that not, you know, every, there's a lot of things being given, but there's nothing being finished type situation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of work. But at what, at what point can we say we've checked that off? You know, obviously we've moved away from to-do list, right? Ed, Uh, that we're now (laughs) we're crowding that calendar. But even in that, at what point are we completing tasks? Instead, I've got 15 tasks here. I'm working on all 15 as this overwhelming person. And I'm constantly trying to keep those 15 up at a time instead of let me concentrate on that one task. All right, let me get that task off the ground. And if I get at a stopping point, I move to the next one. But as a leader, I have to be observant, observant in what I'm giving out. And that may be a thing also, Ed, this is the way I see it. That's the thing with that leader. It should have some type of uh, system, whether it be a whiteboard, an Excel spreadsheet, um, just a a task tracker, so to speak, where they're they're tracking who is completing what task or who is assigned what task. And if they see a common name in there, we, we got a problem. We've got, we've got, somebody's getting overwhelmed, right? Yeah. And somebody's getting over. Oh yeah, absolutely. Somebody's yeah, absolutely. just sweeping the floor every day and taking yep. out the trash and that's all they're doing. Uh, and then you think about that when them, those people are working on those tasks, they have too many tasks. They're getting feedback from you because you're criticizing them and they are not accepting it. They are like, whatever. And then they're coming down harder on their, their subordinates because they're getting criticized and they're, they're saying, they're making comments like this. Hey, I need to get the boss off my back. You guys got to work harder. That type of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah, like you said, you gotta, you know, um, first thing is recognizing it and then how to manage it and how to manage them Mm -hmm. and yourself. So, I mean, knowledge is power, right? Absolutely. And we're going to get into that, how to prevent it or to turn it around. So right here, I'm going to, I'm going to start us off and I'm going to have you jump into that very first one, Ed, upon being identified for leading the new project, the company has several options to invest in the development of their new leader. What's that first one, Ed? Coaching is vital to learning and developing in her new role. Pat needs to identify what areas she needs to develop to be successful in leading the project. A senior leader in the organization could coach Pat to help her gain awareness of her strength and development needs and plan for development. Coaching is a learning and change process. The person being coached learns from experience. At the end of the session, they should develop action strategies to implement. And during the next session, the coach should or a coach could better learn how their client reflects and learns. And this sounds just like counseling in, in the military. <laughs> Uh, yep. coaches help the individual being coached to do their best thinking and come up with a solution for themselves, not the solution the coach thinks is best. This is what gets us our buy-in from the, the person being coached. Uh, the coach establishes a safe but challenging environment for development to occur within this environment. Pat can develop her talents and make a bigger impact on the project and in her relationships with others. Hey, so when we look at that, right, Ed, uh, we, we're actually given three different areas to help, uh, to basically help 
prevent burnout or turn it around. When you look at all three of those areas, we've already done shows on all three of those, you know? Yes, we have. We, I, I was, as I'm reading this and, you know, I'm like, uh, yep, yep, yep. And if not, we've at least spoke about them in depth on our show. Oh, no, I know we've done shows specifically on yeah. each one of these. Specific. Each one of these yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's funny. We didn't read this article before when we did those shows. It, it's just, it's crazy how you can correlate all of this stuff into these simple little things. They seem simple, but if not done correctly or not done at all, they're actually tough because now you're trying to learn something new as a leader while implementing at the same time. So I would definitely say those of you who are becoming brand new leaders, you need to start now, start implementing things like this now. So it becomes habit and habit will kind of build up that muscle memory that we speak of and you'll be able to do it a little bit easier and it'll be, it'll feel more natural as that leader versus you're an old season leader like Ed and I, it's much more seasoned than I, but, um, <laughs> so I think you had to say old season leader, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but with that, it's, it's a little bit tougher, um, it, because so a lot of older season leaders are not like Ed and I, where we are very open to learning and understanding new things and understanding how to d- better develop things. It's we're always, I'm telling you. I, I, I don't I can't speak for Ed, but I can speak for myself on this. As much research as we do into this show, it opens my eyes almost every day to something new that I can kind of help improve upon my organization and self. And I try to take little elements of it because you can't use it all. It's it's so tough to try to use everything. But I can take little elements of it and jab it here and jab it there and then start like building on it. You have leaders that don't do that. And, and you're going to see that whether it be in the service, whether it be in the civil sector, whether it be in your, um, your uh, community, whether it be in whatever type of religion you're a part of, whether it be in your family, you're going to see that in certain people. And then you'll see how others are easily accepting. And it's just try to be one of those ones who says, okay, I got to step back. I've got to learn how to coach properly. Cause that coaching right there, Ed, I mean, we've talked about this influences coaching. That, that was the show. And the fact that it's talking about uh, a senior leader helping Pat in this scenario become, you know, gain awareness of their strengths and then develop what they need and help develop a plan to help move them forward. That's needed instead of just saying, hey, here's a new job for you. Good luck. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you make it through on the other side. See you there, buddy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think th- so. This was really interesting. I just think that the article was pretty, is pretty good. And then to the end, like, it's like, oh, this is, this is us. And then those star performers. So, talking about elevating star performers, Brian, isn't that what Kevin Cruz told us, though? He did say something about favorites and playing favorites. And yeah, absolutely. But you, you do need to elevate them and, and you know, not um, hold them back. Like, but what Kevin was getting to, though, it, it, yeah, you you do elevate them. But he was also explaining you you have to change your leadership for different people. Not everyone is going to get treated the same because we have different types of learning. We have different types of performance. Yeah. We have different types of knowledge already gained. You have to change your leadership style to the individual, right? That goes right into the very next one, which is mentorship. In addition to coaching, Mentoring is a powerful way of developing future leaders. The company could help Pat find a mentor. Mentoring relationships are focused on the learning and development of the protege, in this case, Pat. She plays an active role in the learning with her mentor, who will share their experiences with Pat, help her develop priorities, new knowledge, and find resources to continue her growth learning and development. I mean, we have a mentor we use all the time. We talk about him almost every doggone show. You know it. Yeah. We even plugged his beard bomb earlier. (laughs) (laughs) Made of Cobra venom. Yeah. (laughs) Pomade. (laughs) Yeah. So the bearded ninja, he is kind of a mentor of Ed and I, uh, which I hope uh, to get him on the show very soon. Uh, because I'm home, I did have lunch with him the other day, and it was it's was just awesome to kind of see an old face and you know good friend. But mentor, he was the person when Ed and I were talking about uh, whether to retire or not. 
he was the person that kind of mentored me in the fact of you will know when it is time. You will feel it. If you still love what you do, it's not time. That To me, that's a small uh, performance, coaching, mentoring type situation where it's going to help me. You know what? Don't make a hasty decision. Let's let's go ahead and let's, let's think this through. And I talk with it with my wife and she agrees. She's like, you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe we do need to look at it one step at a time. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what do you think about the next one, Ed? For leadership development programs, former leader. Oh, we talked, you know, this was, we talked about this on an earlier episode, Brian, because I was surprised that a uh, civilian sector would have something like this. Yep. Formal leader development programs are designed. Am I reading the right thing? Yeah, you're right on it, bro. Oh, formal leader development programs are designed to progressively develop the leadership competencies needed for performance at higher levels of responsibility. In this case, to equip Pat with the skills she needs to be successful in her new role leading the project team. If the organization does not have a program, a quick search in your area will reveal what is available. And then it's a shameless plug for the website. No, uh, it says we offer an example of leadership development programs here at Bridge 3, as well as coaching and mentoring resources. We have we have a leadership development program within the Army. We have a multiple uh, levels of it, which I think uh, I think is is a, a it's a resource that's used but could be used more. Uh, for instance, so what we have was we have the basic leader course, we have the advanced leader course, mm-hmm. we have the senior leader course, we have the master leader course, and then we have the uh, USASMA or United States Army Sergeant Majors Academy, right? Though all those different levels. <clears throat> How many times, Ed, have you had somebody that you taught in a course? Just BLC, reach back to you to ask you your opinion or ask for mentorship on it. I, I've I've got a few emails. I actually ran into a soldier like two weeks ago, and he's like, "Hey, you were my instructor." And I'm like, "I was okay," <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, you do get those weird sometimes emails, and then you get the Facebook friend requests and stuff. And, but a lot of times they are asking for um, for mentorship or leader, you know, some kind of guidance. You know, like right now with the promotion list, both coming out for Sergeant First Class and Master Sergeants, there's some Sergeant First Classes as well as some Staff Sergeants that may ask you, hey, you know, you got promoted. Would would you look at my record? So those are mentorship opportunities as well. So and to help them take my place. But And it's, you know what, exactly right about the, helping them take your place. But I think and then I think back about the academy and what we did there. And that was a form of leader development program. I don't see why a civilian entity couldn't try to develop something like that. I mean, shoot, they could even reach out to you and I, and we probably could help them set something up that's formal, get informal to help build the leaders within. I'm I'm not trying to shamelessly plug us or anything, but we could help them out in that manner, you know, Um, and I'm not looking for a monetary value, but I like the idea of helping individuals become better leaders. You know, with the basic leader course, the, some of the things that we were teaching, some might say, oh, that's just common sense. No, it's not always common sense. You know, proper communication, understanding how to listen, understanding the development of good group dynamics, being able to look at your team and say, all right, talent management wise, I have this person who's able, capable of way more than these three together. I've got to get these three on the level of this one over here. So I got to start learning how to partner them up and, and put them on specific tasks. So I use my talent manager correctly to help build the organization, right? So I got to think about them first. This is where that goes back. Take care of the person. They'll take care of the mission. They'll take care of the task. They'll take care of the organization. I need to think about those people and how do I get them at the level they need to be at? That's leader development program. And Mm -hmm. as a senior leader within an organization, I truly truly believe as a senior leader, yes, you have to make decisions at that senior leader level, but I think your primary mission, I don't care what organization you're a part of, your job is leadership development throughout primarily because when you step away from that desk, when you step away from that organization, who's taking your job? Who's able to do what you do? Who's able to do what the guy uh, working directly for you when he moves up to your spot and then that person has to move up to their spot. That's why it's critical. I truly believe it's upon the senior leaders to be able to do that. That's, that's why, you know, I, I really like the idea not only is the leader development programs like our academies type thing, but also 
Ed, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in good NCO professional development, taking at least at a minimum one day a month at a minimum. Now, I think it could be more, but one day a month where you pull those non-commissioned officers aside and you do some leadership development and you teach on the topics that they need to learn, whether it be talent management, communication, group dynamics, um, goodness, just there's a whole array of things, right? Uh, I built, when I, uh, when I got to where I'm at right now, I built a schedule uh, for all the different topics, but then I got about three classes into it. And then I started asking, the, I asked the question, what do you want to learn about? What do you feel like you're, you're not meeting the mark on that you need help on? We wrote this big list on the board. I took a picture of it, Ed. And then I took that. I got rid of my stuff or I meshed it up to what I had already and said, okay, they're wanting to learn about this, this, and this. That matches up to three other things that I have on here. So I'm, we're going to incorporate those together. And then I set dates for the entire year, once a month, that we get together and we learn on those topics. While I'm away, I got one guy that's working on a command supply discipline. Not only that part of it, because that can be kind of a boring topic. Hey, hey. But he's also working on <laughs> <laughs> No, but it can be if you don't understand it really. And he's also going to hit upon really the common uh, areas that he sees need to be improved within the CSDP for the user level. That right there, to me, that that's that's a force multiplier when you're able to do that because now what you're doing is you're taking all that knowledge and now you're redistributing to the masses. Now, will it filter down through the Joes? Yeah, at some point, but it's going to help them out, right? So, all right. So, leader development program. That's that's really uh, that's a key piece, man. Would you say? Yeah. So, and the one thing I've noticed lately in a lot of these articles we read in the military, and really, I think how you may have even introduced it to me military wise, is uh, the focus on talent management. Um, and, and I, I like it and, and it makes sense because, you know, back in the day, you just threw whoever you might throw that round peg at the square hole. Nowadays, it's like, okay, really, is that his talent? Let's figure out his talent. And uh, I noticed that a lot as we prepare for these shows, that that is a big focus across the board now. Oh, yeah. Oh, e easily, man. Easily. And, and it's if that's the focus, then I think what we need to do is as leaders and, and especially as an influencers, we need to reengage that focus then. Because maybe, maybe I mean, even I could be off mark. I need to reengage and say, okay, am I hitting the marks that need to be hit? And lo looking through this, I can tell you right now, we did a um, we did an NCOPDP on our PD on coaching and mentorship, and I mean it. Hopefully, it hit where it needed to, but you know, I hope uh, I hope those who needed it heard it. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, no, it's. I mean, I'm I'm kind of jealous because the position I'm in, I really doesn't afford me necessarily a talent management piece yet, but maybe you know soon. Um, and I, and I like that. I like the, the looking and saying, okay, this soldier's strong in this, this NC is strong here. Let me move this. I, I, I like it. Uh, I think talent management is super important. It's really strange to me that it hasn't really been a issue or a doctrinal thing in the military before, you know, the last few years. So it's kind of strange, but at least it is now. Right. Oh, no. I, I think it's I think it's definitely a way for you, uh, an individual to build confidence and self-esteem in others. And it's a, also a way to rise other people above yourself. Right. So now we're not concentrating. I'm not concentrating on me. I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about that individual and I'm lifting them above me in a sense. You know, that's you know, I if you ever hear I don't like to say uh, uh, those who work below me because no one's below me. Or I don't like to call them lower enlisted. Those are just some of the, the simple words. I know it's words, but to me, I don't like to call them lower enlisted. I like to call them the juniors because they are junior to me, but they're still equal to me type of thing. All right, so let's talk about the very last part here. It's called elevate your star performers. Organizations can boost or obstruct their star performers' development. If they invest in their development, specifically behaviors, mindsets, and reinforcement of learning, they can elevate the individual and the organization. If they don't, then there is a risk of the star performer flaming out and the organization losing a high potential employee. Man, that's right there. Nail on the head, direct hit, 
<laughs> you can really wear them out and you can they're flame out, burn out, whatever you want to call it. They're literally going to just be done and they're not going to want to work there anymore. Um, I think I read a study not too long ago, Ed. It was something about people leave an organization because of the culture, not because of yeah, the pay. Yeah. We, we talked about that, didn't we? Yeah, and I've also, there's a book and uh, it talks a lot about it. It's called The Na- No A-Hole Rule, and it talks a lot about it in that book too. And, you know, the cost. So you have this person, right, who's your star performer. And as they're going through their flaming out process and they're flying off the handle and they're that loose cannon, well, how many people are they affected? How many people are going to lose your organization uh, before something's done about this individual? So you could be costing yourself money while this star performer is flaming out, you know? Um, so that that's crucial, very crucial. Plus, you're going to lose the star performer in the end if they don't realize what's going on and pull out of that nosedive. Absolutely. All right. So th- I want to I'm going to end off uh, this point with about three different tips that I kind of came up with uh, as we were sitting here talking, and I thought about it before also. So if you have anything, I'll let you 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 can throw them out there right after. So I have three different tips, and these tips are for the leaders, but also can be used for the person who may be in the burnout phase. But I really want the leaders or the influencers of their uh, th- those within the organization to really think about this. First thing is enforce them to take time off. Really look at how much are they working? How much are they getting after? How much stuff is tasked at them and force them to take some time of time off, take to, to step away from what's going on with that. You, you really have to think about, okay, how much I'm giving to them. So start tracking that. All right. Track that as an influencer, track that as a leader, see what you're giving out to individuals. So you may want to create a a bit of a, a, a troop to task tracker, we call it, uh, or you can just call it a task tracker within your organization, but create that to help measure those uh, areas. Next thing is, if you get them to take time off, how are you preparing them for coming back ready? For instance, there's ways to go about it. Uh, you can, When somebody has time off, you can send those selfless messages to them. A simple message is, hey, I really hope you're having a great time off. Uh, we really miss you here. Enjoy your time off. I can't wait to get back, you get you back and get after it again. We we enjoy having you a part of this organization. You are an asset. Some simple as that, right? You give them that that feeling of, wow, they really do need me. And and the fact that they realize that they you can still perform without them there so they can take their time away. Right. So think about that. All right. So make sure not only you're forcing them to take the time off, but also preparing them to come back ready. And finally, I want you to think about your talent management. Talent management is it's a multifaceted thing. And we'll probably end up doing a a show upon talent management in the near future. I'm not sure when, but I want you to think about talent management and think about you have to evaluate each individual separately and see what level they're at and competence wise of the uh, what the organization requires of them. And then how are you establishing a new level for each individual? So you may have, let's say Snuffy, Ed, and Schmuckatelli. Snuffy is the the your overperformer. Ed is right there in the middle, and so is Schmuckatelli. We need to get Schmuckatelli and Ed on the same level as Snuffy, but we can't uh, neglect Snuffy. We got to get keep helping that person individ, that our individual grow. So what we have to do is we have to mix it up on how we pair them up. Maybe sitting down with them and going over things with them, or walking through a day with them. You know, just as a leader, sometimes it's okay to say, "All right, I'm going to disengage from my responsibilities for a little bit. I'm going to disengage for half a day, and I'm going to spend that half a day with Ed. I'm going to spend that half a day with Smuckatelli." I want to see what it is they're doing and they understand and see if there's somewhere where we can help elevate them and not turn it into a criticism type situation. Turn it into an AAR. We just talked about that last episode. Learn to use the AAR to help improve them. So those are the three elements I thought about for tips wise, Ed. Did you have anything on your No, you just, so one of the things, and and I see it here because of what we do uh, when we, we call it set the theater, but um, there are times, and, and, and the major that I work for, he's actually pretty good at recognizing when his captains are starting to burn out, and he will absolutely tell them, yeah, I need you to send that last email, and I need you to go home to your family and spend some time with your family. He'll, and some of them, it takes that. Like, he really has to be like, hey, you got to go. 
because he does see that burnout um, in them. So, and, and that's important. Like, you know, it's good that he recognizes that. And, and for us as influencers and leaders, I think that's a crucial skill. We have so many skills that we have to master, but this one here, again, you said earlier, you know, you take care of your subordinates and they'll take care of you, you know, take care of your subordinates, recognize when they're burning out and take care of that. And then they're going to make sure the mission still happens. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, and I think that's important. I think that's a big valuable takeaway from today's uh, episode. Yep. Just watching them, knowing what's going on. If you, if you don't know what's going on in the organization, you're probably uh, a disengaged leader, which is a form of toxic leadership. It is. So uh, with that, we're coming up on uh, episode 50. Not too long. Yeah. Questions, questions, questions. questions. Riddle me this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, one of the uh, special things we're going to bring to you uh, during that episode 50 also, Ed and I have been discussing it. We both received uh, a message from a prior subordinate, each of us. And, and it's not like it's something that we, we weren't soliciting from them or anything. It was just out of the blue. We received, I, I got an email from the one and he's been, he's been chatting back and forth with me more. He knows who he is. He's down in Alabama. Uh, Ed, he's got another, he's got one who, uh, who reached out to him recently because that individual was listening to the show. So we want to share that with you also within that Q and a show. Uh, we're going to read those messages from those individuals, not to, uh, not to put their in who they are out on there, but to kind of, kind of highlight what the show has been doing, not only for us, but also for others, because that's really what this show was based off. It was, all right, we're at a point in our lives and our careers where we need to help others become better. So when we walk away from what we're doing, they become better. But we also want to do it just across the masses. Now, I, I don't care who it is. If if something comes up in this top and in one of these topics, and it's going to help somebody become a better influencer at their organization, whether it's civilian, family, community, uh, religious preference, uh, uh, work, then we have met our mark. We're meeting our basically our mission that we have set for ourselves. And you can see that on the website also, if you look it up, but what we need is we need questions. Send them to myself or Ed. Ed and I, you can you can instant message us through Facebook. Just send them privately if you want. And if you want your name kept private, fine. Let us know. And we will do that. We we don't mind. Also, we need your feedback. We don't know we don't know where we stand with you all. All right. Uh, what do you what are your thoughts about the show? What do you what are you thinking right now? Is there is there something that we're not meeting the mark on are your expectations? Uh, I, I feel like I'm meeting the expectations that Ed and I kind of, I guess we've notionally accepted as expectations of the show, but we want to know. So this is the task for this week. Although the show was about burnout, we don't want to burn you out from our show. <laughs> we want you to, uh, I don't know, gain new knowledge, understanding, and then want to reach out and help other people also. So it's a trickle down effect. If not, I'd rather have it be more like a waterfall effect, but hey, trickle down works for me too. Let us know. Episode 44 task is what are your thoughts about the show this thus far? 44 in. Let us know. And I mean, it, it could be, give us a thumbs up. I don't care. Give us a happy face, a <laughs> mad face, whatever. Because you give me a mad face, I'm going to find out who you are. I'm going to message you. All right. No, just joking. Uh, what do you think? What are you thinking, Ed? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd like to get some really challenging questions for Brian, some some softballs for me. I mean, I think the listeners have the capability to do that, and I, I would welcome them. <laughs> softball. Yeah, whatever, man. You <laughs> smash it out of the park if it's softball. We got to throw fastballs that's at why, you. That's why I want a softball. <laughs> <laughs> you want questions like, what's your favorite sandwich? Yeah, I just watch Monty Python. I'm, I have three questions. <laughs> what <laughs> is your name? <laughs> <laughs> that's an e Yeah, that's so definitely like, a What hello, is your I favorite hear. color? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so where can they where can they uh can they throw these questions at us, Ed? Well, they can go to the Instinctive Influencers closed Facebook page, answer the question, join the group. Uh, they can post there. They can instant message us through Facebook as well. They can find us on the on the gram on Instagram for uh, under Instinctive Influencers. There's also Twitter. 
there's individual emails like there's just a number of ways that they could reach us and uh hopefully they will absolutely one zero one influence it's just one and then a zero and then a one and then influence spelled out doesn't have to be capitalized or anything one zero one influence look for it join the group if yes. you don't if you don't even reply i mean we just like to throw some things out there every once in a while that you know kind of help uh help us understand different things i have a picture i wanted to share the wording on that picture i just recently saw all right so i have something i want to share i saw this on recently uh on an individual's uh, Facebook page. It was just, you know, like the memes and stuff. And I want to end the show off with it because it kind of made me think about uh, the topic of this show, but also kind of a better reflection on things in life, right? So now, every time I witness a strong person, I want to know, what dark did you conquer in your story? Mountains do not rise without earthquakes. That uh, that said a lot to me. Uh, I actually I graduated with this young lady, and she had it on her. And she's not. I mean, she's my age. I still want to call her young lady. Uh, I graduated in high school, and I and she's a friend on Facebook. And I saw that on her. That was one of her things on that. You know, obviously you see through your feed. And I saw that, and I thought, man, that really that really means a lot. You know, uh, September is over now that you you hear this. But Ed, real quick, there's a, there's a key factor about September uh, in the army. What is it? Uh, would that be it's suicide awareness month? Absolutely. My yes, friend. And I just wanted to, I kind of wanted to hit upon that in a sense, because sometimes, um, uh, I want to touch upon the whole burnout thing. Sometimes we burn people out so far that they take drastic measures. And as influencers and leaders, we need to be able to be observant of that. And you know, if you know anything about Ed and I, the 22 a day thing means a lot. But it's not just the 22 service members a day to me or Ed. It's just a life in general, taking one's life. That's not the answer. So I want people to think about that. And when I read that about the darkness and you know what darkness did they have to conquer to get to the, the point they were, I think about that's one of the things I think about, but also not only the, you know, the struggles. So if there's anything you can take from this show, remember, burnout can really turn into something very bad, very nasty, very quickly. All right. So as an influencer, please be observant. Uh, with that, you got anything else, my brother? No, I think uh, we're going to wrap up another good one. Another good oh, one. Yeah. I loved it, man. Yeah. So with that, I am Brian. And I am Ed. And this has been the Instinctive Influencers Podcast. We thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.